Good morning. I'm going to try and bring things back to a very deeply practical level because I, I, I like that a lot. And I opened my um, talk at Jumpstart yesterday with this um, quote, which is one of my favorite quotes when it comes to data. Um, information is powerful, said a Kenyan farmer, but it is what we use it for that will define us. And I, I love, I love this quote. Because if you look at all the hype that connects to big data, it solves for the first problem. I think that if you listen to all the vendors and all 99% of speakers, myself perhaps included, um, you'll see there's a lot of emphasis on this first part and very little emphasis on the second part. And, and what I do um, at Google and, and at other companies is, is play with one of the largest sources of data in the world with, with, with websites um, and, 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 and entities that get uh, more than a billion hits a day uh, and tens and millions and millions of these things. And when you play with all that stuff, one of the key things you have to try and figure out is how do you make all these petabytes and terabytes and zettabytes of data actionable to the person that is sitting on the ground and, and then a lot more useful? So I actually don't really care about the promise of data unless we can deliver on the promise that comes with the data. And, and, and one of the things that I, I have figured out is that the model that we've used to take data and internalize with companies has been broken for a very long time. So the, the typical model in the company is there's a lot of data, and we Hadoopify it and, and you know, have a lot of sexy fun with it. And, and there are a lot of people who need that data, some really arrogant ones, you know, CXOs, whatever. And they're like, oh, I don't need data. I have Jesus or faith. And that's fine. And, and what we do is we hire these, these, these gods and princelings to go take this data, convert it into reports, and hopefully pray to God that they will take action at the other end. And, and the problem with this model is that it, it doesn't actually scale because as the users multiply, we, we run around like bunnies trying to find people that don't exist, whose job then it is to produce ever more data and then start hitting people with it every single day to try and produce action. Ironically, what happens is the company becomes more inefficient and not less. It's a very, very, very sad, pathetic story, right? <laughs> <laughs> and, and the thing that I like more is this idea of creating a data democracy where you still have all this data and you've still figured out how to make love to it. And, and there are these people, and rather than creating this intermediate layer between them, you kind of dump them over there and say, you janitor, you will figure out how to use data every day to do your job better. And you, the marketer, God forbid, will have to figure out how to use data better and then get them making love to the data directly so that they can make decisions to improve their lives every day. And there will be, still be arrogant people who refuse to touch data because their faith still sustains them. For them, we will create these princes who will play with it and dump data. And the big difference in this scenario is because you've empowered every person to take power of the data, is that very, very large decisions will be made in the name of Jesus and God, and the all other actual useful decisions will be made by people closer to the data. And this scales, right? The great thing is that this scales because it's a part of every person's job rather than having these people in the blue run around like bunnies trying to produce something, right? And I found that this drives, drives a lot of innovation, but of course there is always a fly in the ointment, right? And in this case, the problem is that the world we live in now doesn't look like this, which was very manageable a few years ago when I played with terabyte data warehouses, but it actually looks more like this. And we still have these people here, and now, they are scared and peeing in their pants, right? <laughs> the fuck, what is this? Big friggin' data, right? <laughs> just, all right, so, <laughs> so I, 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 I have found a great solace in trying to figure out how to get rid of this fly in the ointment by one of the greatest philosophers when it comes to analytics. I'm not a big fan of this man, but he said one of the most greatest things that have really powered my thinking in the space. And then what he said is, we screwed up because in life, I'm not going to say we screwed up. He still doesn't believe it. But anyway, we screwed up because in life there are the known knowns, things we know that we know. There are the unknown unknowns, the things that we know we don't know. But we really got hosed because there are things that we don't know that we don't even know. The ones love love this thing, right? I just love the idea that the entire data world can be boiled down into these three corrosive problems, right? Love, love, 
I, I thank God for creating Donald Rumsfeld for giving me this quote. <laughs> And so when I think about that, that massive people running with their heads cut off in front of data, I sort of frame things into three buckets, right? And, and, and my job is to then try and figure out how to solve these problems for people so that the world is a better place having used data to make decisions, right? And then when I think about these three things in our daily life, they fall into these three outcomes for me, right? <laughs> just this is most of our life, right? <laughs> We know what we do, and we just puke it like hell on things we call dashboards, right? <laughs> and the known unknowns are more fall into the category of analysis throwing. I was just oh, it's gonna use well, yeah, whatever. And the thing that I love is this last part, right? If we could figure this thing out, we could have saved Afghanistan from a big problem, right? And then so. When, when it comes to data on the web, the thing that I deal with, billions and billions and billions of rows of data, what I want to figure out is how to do this better, because if I do this better, I can create that, right? These two things are very, very closely tied together. You don't do the former, you don't get the latter, right? And so the question to me is like, you know, what is my big data solving for, and what is your big data solving for? And, and I've come up with sort of two examples to show you how uh, we try and solve this problem. The one is a very super tactical solution, and the other one is this, this uh, a bit more strategic, a bit more complex. But in both cases, I'm trying to, try, trying to figure out if I have billions of rows of data available to me, how do I actually find the unknown unknowns? Because that is a very sexy, complex problem to solve. So the first one is just so astonishingly simple that, like, I had an instant orgasm when we just thought of it, right? I mean, it's just so brilliant. And so here's the problem, right? Here's the problem. The problem we have is that there's a massive amount of data, even for tiny, tiny websites that I have. And in this case, what I want to figure out is a very simple question, which piece of content produces how much money for me, right? And then that's, that's available there very, very easily. And then the challenge with the top 10 rows of data is the 10 rows of data hardly tell me anything about what is happening in 1.6 million other rows that exist. Because right? the top 10 rows of any data set rarely changes. It's just a common part of life. Right? And so what I've said, oh, I really want to know where I make a lot of money so I can learn from it and take action. And the problem is I reverse sort it, and it turns out, well, that's like three people. Like, what the hell am I going to do with these three people? And there's nothing I could learn from their behavior that I could use to take action to make more money. I like money, right? And so I said, ah, oh, screw this thing. Let me find all the other problems where I'm making no money and figure out how to fix it. And so I sort it the other way. And I, damn, screw it again. Because again, it's like three people. What am I going to do with it, right? And, and this is a very common problem that we face in, in data is that the data at the extremities tends to be very sparse. And hence, it tends to be very useless in trying to figure out what to do. The real magic is in the middle problem. We cannot see 1.6 million rows in this case. All I can see is 10, 20 with my glasses on and a large 96-inch monitor, maybe 100 rows, right? But that's it. And yet the magic exists there. The magic to improve people's lives and make money exists there, right? <laughs> And so we started, we came up with this hypothesis that the actual values that exist uh, that are being reported by the solution at the very extremities are not the real values. The behavior of people doesn't exist like that. So we said, we'll come up with what should be an estimated true value for any particular dimension. And if we have enough number of people reporting it, it's probably closer to the side average. If you have very few people reporting that data, it's probably um, much closer to the side average than being the actual value that somebody has reported. So if somebody said, you know, $139 were made by the action of this one person, it's probably not true in real life. And so what, what we decided is to move away from reporting the actual value and start reporting the estimated true value. And the benefit of this is so sexy is that now I get this little button on top. And when I press that button, it sorts the data by interestingness. It says, here are the rows of data. Notice, notice the first and the second columns. They're randomly sorted as if, as if um, using no logic, but the sorting is done based on where we believe now, having analyzed your hundreds and millions of rows of data, the biggest opportunity exists for you to make money in this case. And we've gone through tons and tons of data and found for you the highest places to make money and the worst things you have ever created in your life that you should kill. 
It would be very, very hard to find this data any other way, right? And then you can do this in any scenario. So here's, we're trying to figure out what are the BFFs when it comes to collecting data on the internet. And it's very, very easy for us to figure out where we should do advertising, where we should do promotions, where we should do different things, because the data is now sorted by interestingness. And, and, and I love the way um, that this solves the problem of identifying the unknown unknowns, things that you don't even know exist in your data set. In this case, massive opportunities for you to improve lives of other people who deal with you, and that in turn creates a data democracy. The second problem is, is second solution is even more interesting and, and fun for me personally. So today when people log into these kinds of tools, this is Google Analytics, a massively awesome tool, they run into these problems of data puking. <laughs> and every single day you have to figure out what, is, what, is, what are the things that I need to deal with in order to make um, actions, uh, create actions that will drive better things in our life. And, and, and what happens is that we naturally gravitate towards this column when we should probably be gravitating towards this column, right? And so the way that we solve this problem of, of trying to get people to identify the unknown unknowns is to say, why don't we create an algorithm that is really, really smart? Rather than you waking up in the morning and saying, I am the brilliant genius incarnation of the most brilliant genius data scientist that ever lived on Earth, why doesn't the system be smart enough to say, let us give you better starting points for your data? Right? Let us actually apply intelligence. So what we do is we've created this algorithm that uses control limits, that has a nice kind of sophisticated forecasting algorithm built in. It does sensitivity analysis of your data. And when you wake up in the morning and log into the tool, it actually tells you the unknown unknowns without you having to do anything. And so when you log into Google Analytics, you don't get this data puke. Well, you'd get this data puke. You could puke with it. It's fine. But what is more interesting is we say, look, we found interesting things in your data that you don't even know exist. And you can highlight them. It's very, very cool. It says something interesting happened in Germany for this particular piece of data, with this particular campaign, this particular page, this particular X, Y, and Z. And the really, really cool thing is you can say, I don't have a lot of time, so only show me data that is six standard deviations away from the mean. Show me things that are super fantastically big, or I have nothing better to do. I've just abandoned my mother. I have all the time in the world. Just show me even the tiny little things so that I can just spend wallowing in data all day long. Right? You get to make the choice. And the other thing is, for everything that gets highlighted, we tell you what the significance of that result is. Like, is it really, really important that you pay attention to this, or it's not very important that you pay attention to this? And we show you what were the predictive ranges that we found for these data things. We will tell you that we were anticipating. Our, our predictive power says we expected this to be in this particular range, but the real results we received were this, and that is why you need to pay attention to this thing that happens. And, and this was just absolutely amazing because people said, this is great, but you're still not telling me what to do. And so like, okay, fine, fine. Not a problem, right? And so now what we do is we actually go into the data and find for you things that are highly correlated that explain this odd behavior that our algorithm has found. So not only do we tell you what the unknown unknowns are, we tell you those unknown unknowns that happen because of this. And all you do, my sweetheart, is have a little lollipop and take some freaking action now, right? And this is brilliant, right? brilliant, because we go away from just having people use a tool with billions and billions of hits in it to do data puking, to actually proactively delivering unknown unknowns to them so they can take better actions and create a data democracy. And then, by the way, if you happen to be you know, BFS with Donald Rumsfeld and he loves known unknowns, not a problem, right? Because we've got a solution built in where you can apply your own brilliance and say, just tell me when this happens in the data. And you can create all of these things, and we will highlight for you things that you know will happen, but you don't know when they will happen. And we will tell you when they happen, and not only puke it at you, we will tell you what you did to cause that to be an outcome. Frickin'. Insane, right? I'm really not interested in having lots of big data. I'm not really interested in having massive heads explode because of the size of the data we have. What I'm really, really interested in, and what I hypothesize you should be interested in, is trying to figure out how to use that and the intelligence we possess to make life 
better for the people who are in our companies, who deal with our data, people who work at our clients, and people at the other end who use our products and services. And I think that if you create a data democracy that is <laughs> sans data puking <laughs> and is driven by this quest to find things in the data that other people would never know exist, I, I really believe that we can, we can empower the kind of action every day that otherwise would be impossible. Thank you very much.